Hello, I'm Charles. I'm a trustee at Essex Wildlife Trust. And I want to tell you about this feather. Most people that are in the know would look at it and say it's a very boring pigeon's feather. Okay, it's got interesting barbs and it's cleverly constructed so that it stays together and helps the pigeon to fly. But I want to convince you that it's really very special indeed. And to do that, I'm going to go out in a very big way and talk about the galaxy. Now we happen to live in a very special galaxy. They're shaped not, all, not terribly differently from a saucepan lid. And we happen to live in a galaxy that has lots of heavy elements, lots of heavy metals. There are lots of other galaxies out there that don't have that. We happen to be very lucky to live in one that does. We also to be, happen to be extremely lucky to live on the, roughly in the middle here, between the center and the edge. Because in the center, there's all sorts of nasty things that could sterilize planets very easily indeed. So like quasars and pulsars and enormous black holes. Conversely, on the outside, there's not enough metals and other heavy elements to actually construct planets. So being roughly in the middle there is brilliant for us. And it's extremely fortunate that our sun is there. The next thing is that our sun has sufficient amounts of heavy elements to be able to construct planets. Now, not all suns can do that. Sometimes they're just able to make hydrogen and helium gas giants and no terrestrial rocky planets. So we're very lucky on that score as well. We're also extremely lucky that we have an enormous partner called Jupiter that is, acts like a shield to stop us getting hit by enormous meteors and comets. And it's been doing that job ever since the planet formed four and a half billion years ago. Okay, one or two smaller ones have got through, but it's by and large been doing a very good job and has stepped stop the planet being sterilized. The next thing to think about is how, how the, wor the world works. And there's a number of things that are very unusual about our planet. And one of them is the obliquity. Now the obliquity, if you think of the, of the Earth as being that ball of clay, and the UK as being my little red dot there, yeah, stay on there. So the obliquity is a slight angle. So if this was the sun, we go round at an angle to the sun. And that means that we have seasons. So there are certain points of the year when the red dot there, the UK on my clay ball, is actually facing the sun, that's summer. And when we go to the other side, it's a, at a la large angle, so that's winter. Now, planets that don't have an obliquity that have a very high, a very low obliquity, zero obliquity, have a big problem. And that is that when a snowflake falls, it never melts, summer never comes. And that therefore means that the polar caps grow to enormous sizes. So if we had that on this planet, we would not have our seasons. And the ice cap would probably reach from the North Pole all the way down to London or Paris. So that's the problem with the lower low obliquity and there is a lot of debate as to pl whether planets like that are actually habitable or not. The temperatures are so low, could anything actually survive there? The converse of that is very high obliquity and that would mean that when it's that way it would be permanent daylight getting hotter and hotter and hotter each day until the temperatures on the surface would be hot enough to melt lead. But when the planet goes around the other side of the sun it would be in permanent darkness, which would mean the night would get colder and colder and colder for six months until it was something like 100 degrees below, cell, below zero Celsius. A very nasty place to live in a high obliquity planet. And our obliquity is kept at 23 degrees by the fact we have a large moon that actually circles our planet and stabilizes it. Now, our moon is much bigger proportionally for our planet than it should be. No other planet in our solar system has such a large proportional moon. 
And the origin of the moon is really unusual because what seems to have happened is another Mars-sized planet has come in and impacted the, impacted the Earth about three and a half, four billion years ago and thrown off huge quantities of mantle material into space to orbit our planet. And that eventually coalesced to create our moon. That's a reasonably well accepted theory now. And the other advantage that happened in that process was Thea's, this little planetesimal, Mars-sized planet, its core joined with ours. So we have a large iron nickel core with lots of radioactive elements. And the huge advantage for us in that is that our planet has a hot core. It keeps the planet warm. And it also provides us with our magnetic field by generating convection currents within the mantle and the outer core. So we are really fortunate in that. And it must be extremely rare that a small planet like ours has such a large moon. The next thing is that same radioactive issue with the core actually provides us with plate tectonics and allows the plates to move around the world very slowly. They say it's at about the same speed your fingernails grow, about four centimeters a year. And that actually helps to regulate our climate. And it does this because one of the things that happens to carbon dioxide in the air, which is, as we probably all know, is a, is a greenhouse gas and too much of it makes our planet hotter. Well, that gets absorbed and combined with calcium in the sea and magnesium to create carbonates like the White Cliffs of Dover, the chalk, and the limestones that have, we have in many parts of the UK. And that locks away the calcium, locks away the uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If we didn't have some way of getting that back out again, the planet would get colder and colder and colder until the temperatures dropped about 30 degrees Celsius and it would be an ice planet. However, there is a process that's driven by the radioactive elements in the core called plate tectonics, which allows the plates to move around the world, the oceanic plates to move around, and when they hit a continent, they go underneath it. So they go along like that, they hit a continent, and down they go. And what happens then is the carbon dioxide that's locked away in the carbonates, in the chalk and the limestone, on that plate when it goes down, get melt, gets melted, and the carbon dioxide comes back up through volcanoes and re-enters the atmosphere. So plate tectonics is enormously helpful in regulating our climate and keeping us nice and warm. No other planet in our solar system has plate tectonics or anything like it. So it looks like it's quite a rare phenomena. The next thing is how did life actually evolve here? Well, we don't know how rare things like very simple bacteria are. They could be very common in, this, in our galaxy. But what we do suspect is that them moving on to creating plants and animals is very rare because something very unusual happened when, in effect, one bacteria swallowed another but didn't digest it and allowed it to live. And some of these enclosed bacteria turned into chloroplasts and the whole thing eventually became our trees and our plants. And it happened a second time and the enclosed bacteria became the mitochondria that allows us to love and laugh and run and powers us. And that, those cells eventually evolved into animals. But there's something else that happened and we don't understand why it happened. We have theories. And that is something called the Cambrian Explosion happened. And basically that means that before then, for about three billion years, the only life on our planet was microbial, tiny things that you couldn't even see, living in the sea and in the swamps. And suddenly, in the Cambrian Explosion, animals appeared everywhere. Trilobites, jellyfish, all sorts of things appeared. And nobody understands why that happened. So whatever that drove that must be a very rare occurrence. That happened about 600 million years ago. And since then, animal life and plant life has spread out across the planet. But we've also been hit a number of times. Five times we've been hit by mass extinction events. One of them, the last one, the Chicxulub, the meteorite impact that extinguished the dinosaurs, but left the birds, fortunately, and our feather. 
fail to sterilize the the earth because Jupiter had prevented anything larger coming in so we were very unlucky with that one but the other four mass extinctions we don't know what drove those but none of them was quite severe enough to sterilize the planet so we're very fortunate that animal and plant life carried on through that but now things are changing about 10,000 years ago there were two million humans on the planet 2,000 years ago there were probably about 200 million we hit a billion in about 1800 and we hit 2 billion in about 1930. Populations now are about 7 billion and are expected to grow to about 11 billion by the end of this century. This has put enormous pressure on animals and plants around the world in wild places. So this pigeon will be under pressure as will marsh geese and brent geese and water voles and toads and we have to find a way to get them through because there is some good news in here and that is that when we reach the year 21,000, 2100 we will start to have our populations decline and the reason for that is that when people families have food and health care and modern conveniences like washing machines they don't want so many children anymore contraception allows the mother to say I don't want six children I'm quite happy with one and that means that the world will change so in about 150 years our descendants will be looking at cities and saying we need to rewild this city because nobody's living there let's actually clear out the few remaining people from this city in this town and actually start to rewild it and they will then be looking for the Brent geese, they will be looking for the water voles, for the hedgehogs, for the toads to re-establish in these new forests and hoping that the jays and the squirrels can replant the oak tree, the acorns and the oak trees and so the world will return to a more natural state with humans still here. But somehow we have to get these species through. So if I gave you a spaceship that could travel at the speed of light and you were going to live for a billion years and I sent you off into the galaxy to try and find another of these feathers you would die never seeing another one. We are so rare, our planet is so rare. Astronomers look out to try and see signals from alien civilizations and they see nothing. It probably means that this feather on our planet is the only time you would ever see a feather anywhere. Save the world, join Essex Wildlife Trust. You can register and join on the website and that's the one way to try and help wildlife get through to the future and save us and the planet. Thank you.